Madam Minister, again, thank you very much for being here, for your words, and for the uh, hospitality of uh, the United Arab Emirates, which uh, we appreciate all the more that uh, I think the basic ideas of your foreign uh, policy coincide, I would say, almost perfectly with the aims of the World uh, Policy Conference ever since uh, its uh, inception. inception. Before uh, giving the floor to the uh, two uh, prominent uh, speakers who will uh, speak after me, le patriarche de sa santé, le patriarche de Constantinople, qui nous fait l'honneur chaque année d'être euh, parmi nous, et euh, le grand rabbin de France, euh, Raim Corsia, qui est aussi un, un grand ami de certains d'entre nous. Euh, je voudrais euh, dire que l'idée d'inviter aujourd'hui particulièrement deux grandes personnalités qui représentent euh, le monde religieux, certains aspects du monde religieux, parce qu'ici nous sommes en terre d'islam, euh, donc la troisième euh, religion euh, monothéiste, a une signification particulière. Cette signification, je le dirais en un mot, mais euh, nos éminentissimes, euh, euh, invités le diront mieux que moi, c'est que dans le monde moderne, la religion importe. Et elle doit importer positivement. Now I will switch to my usual speech where I will try to give you a general idea of my general idea of where the world is uh, going these days and I will say it partly in French and partly in English. Et je commencerai par le français. Je suis désolé, I apologize for not being yet able to do it in Arabic. Euh, mais là, je, je crains que ce soit un peu long hein, pour, euh, pour y arriver. Depuis euh, la 14e édition de la World Policy Conference, euh, ici à Abu Dhabi, le 1er octobre, euh, au début octobre de l'année 2021, l'instabilité du système international a encore augmenté. Certes, la situation s'est améliorée sur le, front, sur le front sanitaire, quoique l'incertitude demeure sur l'apparition de nouveaux variants plus ou moins dangereux et contagieux du Covid-19. Nous aurons des sessions importantes sur ce sujet dimanche, si je ne me trompe. Mais les effets innombrables des crises sociales et économiques qu'il a provoquées se font toujours sentir, notamment sur les chaînes d'approvisionnement et bien d'autres sujets. Ces effets sont démultipliés par les conséquences directes et indirectes de nouveaux facteurs disruptifs, principalement la guerre, commencée le 24 février 2022 avec l'agression de la Russie en Ukraine, mais aussi de manière actuellement plus feutrée avec les tensions croissantes autour de Taïwan dont nous avions déjà parlé beaucoup l'an dernier. Incidemment, je préfère parler de la guerre d'Ukraine plutôt que de la guerre en Ukraine, pour la même raison qu'il y a sept décennies, on parlait de la guerre de Corée et non pas de la guerre en Corée. La guerre d'Ukraine a et aura des conséquences innombrables à l'échelle planétaire qui se feront sentir à court, moyen et long terme. And now I switch to English. Sorry, to French English, but it is English nevertheless. The combination of shocks, above all the Ukraine war, with the profound disruption it has already caused in sectors such as food, and probably more permanently in energy, has accelerated inflation, which I myself took very seriously last year, more probably than many uh, economists uh, at the time. Over the past half century, 
The only way to fight inflation in the short term has been to raise interest rates and thus to go through a temporary recession. Of course, there is also the old method of price controls, possibly disguised as a buffer, uh, as a buffer which consists in uh, making the state to pay a proportion of bills, mainly for energy, with a corresponding increase in the public deficit. By this but this method does not overcome the problem of the adjustment of supply and demand. In the longer term, inflation can be warded off by investment, but with the risk, as at present with uh, President Biden's plan, of encouraging protectionism and distorting competition laws. We are now in a more serious situation than the one that followed the oil shocks of the 1970s, whose security consequences in the Middle East are still remembered. In the 1980s, the United States was preparing for wars against oil-producing nations. Today, things are different in this respect, if only because of the energy autonomy that the United States has achieved since then, and the relative retreat of the world's leading power following its numerous, generally ill-fated interventions since the beginning of the 21st century. The lack of clarity in US policy in the Middle East is in fact currently one of the sources of uncertainty specific to the region, particularly with regard to Iran. However, the situation should become clearer if the Ukraine war continues, making the energy decoupling of Europe from Russia irreversible, with the long-term consequence of increasing Europe's security Europe's security dependence on the United States and the Middle East. It is also possible that this is the desire of the world's leading power in the face of China's rise. The year 2022 will also be characterized around the world by a significant increase in extreme weather phenomena, such as the catastrophic floods in Pakistan and other extreme events. From now on, no one can deny the extent of the climate change that is underway with its inevitable consequences in all areas, for example, in the health sector and due to the potentially massive increase in migration. From this standpoint also, there are negative effects from the Ukraine war if only in terms of hindering rollout of the measures needed to slow down global warming. This brings us to global issues such as public health and climate. It is vital to ask the following political question, which can be formulated very simply. Despite the intensification of China-US rivalry, which increasingly appears to be irreversible, will the two superpowers of the 21st century manage to cooperate for a better governance of humanity's common good, which is crucial for the future of the Earth? Nobody can deny the importance of this question anymore. Unfortunately, the answer is not straightforward. Evidently, a scenario involving major confrontation between the two superpowers over Taiwan is plausible, according to the most respected analysts and commentators in the field of international relations. This leads me back to the Ukraine war. After February 24, the war was quickly perceived, not, not universally, but in Western public opinion, that is essentially NATO and European, European, uh, European Union countries, 
as a war of good versus evil, and even democracy versus dictatorship. A little more than 10 months later, this perception has not changed much. The diplomacy of President Biden, who on November 29 announced the second edition of the Democracy Summit, bears witness to this. For his part, President Putin denounces what he views as an imperialist and decadent West. And he is not alone in, his view, in this view. Even though almost all UN member states have recognized the aggression against Ukraine, most reject such a binary opposition viewed as overly simplistic between democracy and dictatorship and have a more nuanced assessment of who is responsible for this delayed confrontation between East and West, a veritable final battle in a Cold War which failed to end with the collapse of the Soviet Union at the end of 1991. Although their core interests are not at stake in this battle, many countries are directly impacted by its consequences, often to a significant extent. The majority of states do not want to be forced to choose sides, no more than in the context of the US-China rivalry, which forms an all-pervading backdrop. The most powerful among them, such as India, take pride in their civilizations and claim full sovereignty on the, for their choices. In terms of the legitimacy of international law, some have expressed surprise and even denounced the double standard in the legal treatment given, for example, to the 20, 2003 uh, US war against Iraq compared with Russia's war against Ukraine today. And this is not the only example. The issue of just how democratic developments in international law have been, deserves to be examined dispassionately. And some leading jurists are beginning to do so. This is a crucial question for the medium to long term of the international system, and the WPC could take it on board for its future editions, as it endeavors to do with anything that could significantly impact the course of international relations. In the short to medium term, it is in the general interest of society, if not of the international community. Society, the international community is much more a society than a community. So in the short to medium term, therefore taking into account, you know, the legitimacy, the legitimate interests of middle and small powers, it is crucial to push, to encourage, to push Russia and Ukraine to engage in the pursuit of a negotiated peace within the framework of international law, and not in any case an international law uh, which is, uh, by which I mean uh, positive law and not natural law. Uh, there are a lot of confusion of, about the very nature of international law, which is in any case not derived from any sort of legitimate global constitution of the world, which just does not exist uh, for the time being. However, there are forces fueling the conflict even if it means increasing the risk of escalation and making largely unforeseeable long-term upheavals more likely at every level. This is a brief outline of the context in which this 15th edition of WPC is taking place. Our ambition remains unchanged. It continues to be to work in favor of a governance that safeguards the chances for what I call a reasonably open world, away from the two extremes of, on the one hand, a return to division into blocks that are radically separated by ideology, and on the other hand, the Fukuyama 
style flat world following the end of history philosophy dreamed after the Cold War by liberal globalist ideologues. And the, implementa the implementation, implementation of this idea uh, ran over a 20 uh, year period, let us say from the dissolution of the USSR to the Arab Spring, the so-called Arab Spring, and uh, this has turned the world upside down for the better or for the worse. It is against this false set of alternatives that the middle powers stand, and their viewpoints are of the utmost interest to the friend of the world, to the friends with an S of the World Policy Conference. Despite the Ukraine war, I am convinced that the European Union member states themselves do not wish to be trapped in choices that could, in the long run, drag them back to the darkest moments of the 20th century. The current mission of the European Union is to consolidate itself as an area of peace, prosperity and social justice in order to better exercise its role as a global player. It is this time to enlarge, but not at the cost of weakening itself as a result of the proliferation of functional inefficiencies that uh, weaken it and even threaten its existence. For similar reasons, it is vital that it reduces its external, it, it is the European Union, huh? it reduces its external uh, dependence in matters of security and manages to show itself capable in the coming years of taking the lead in the reconstruction of a European security system worthy the name worthy of the name, and therefore one that is based on realism. Alongside this, it must develop a far more ambitious and coherent, coherent policy vis-à-vis -vis its neighbors, particularly from Africa and the Middle East. Et je vais conclure en français. Cette 15e édition de la WPC abordera diverses facettes de la problématique que je viens d'esquisser. Et je souhaite que nos travaux manifestent un bon usage et un bon dosage de réalisme à court terme, mais aussi d'idéalisme à long terme. Surtout pas dans le sens inverse. Réalisme à court terme, idéalisme à long terme. Sans lequel, sans idéalisme à long terme, Rien de généreux ne peut aboutir. Je remercie chaleureusement les Émirats arabes unis qui nous reçoivent magnifiquement de nous manifester ainsi leur soutien. Madame la ministre, j'espère que vous aurez reconnu dans vos propos quelques-unes des idées qui me semblent être présentes dans votre propre politique étrangère. Je vous remercie.